Hi, and welcome back to my series of videos for Physical Chemistry 1. Today, I want to tell you more about the discoveries of Nicolas Sadi Carnot. In the last video, we talked about his studies of steam engines and the thermodynamics behind them, and we saw that he came up with the model we now call the Carnot cycle, which describes the changes a heat engine undergoes as it operates. One of Carnot's goals was to learn how to make steam engines more efficient. How can we design an engine so that less of the energy output of the engine is lost as heat, and more is converted into work? Carnot discovered that the efficiency of a heat engine can be expressed using this equation. The numerator is just the difference between the temperatures of the hot and cold reservoirs. Note that all the temperatures in this equation must be in kelvins. For example, suppose we build a steam engine in which the cold reservoir is just 1.00 degrees Celsius and the steam in the hot reservoir is at 150.00 Celsius. What would be the efficiency of this engine? We'll use this equation. Remember to convert all the temperatures to Kelvin. When we do, we find that the efficiency of the engine is 0.355 or 35.5%. Let's look at this equation a little more deeply, though. Suppose we wanted to build an engine that was more efficient. How could we do it? Well, this equation shows us that there are two ways to increase the efficiency. First, we could increase the numerator. That means we need to increase the difference between the temperatures of the two reservoirs. So, we could make the cold reservoir colder and the hot one hotter. The other possibility would be to reduce the denominator of the fraction. That would mean lowering the temperature of the hot reservoir. So, raising the temperature of the hot reservoir raises the numerator and therefore increases the efficiency. And lowering the hot temperature lowers the denominator and that also increases the efficiency. But what if we wanted to create an engine that's 100% efficient? How could we do that? To be 100% efficient, the fraction would have to be equal to 1, which means the numerator and the denominator would need to be the same. That means that the cold temperature would need to be 0 Kelvin. So the only way to get a perfectly efficient engine would be to hold the cold reservoir at absolute 0, and that's not possible. So this tells us that no real engine can ever be completely efficient some of the energy of the engine will always be wasted, which usually means that it will be converted into heat. Now let's look a little more deeply at the implications of all we've learned about the entropy in the last few videos. Suppose we have an isolated system, that is, matter can't get in or out of our container, but neither can energy, including heat. This container is divided into two chambers. There's an immovable wall between the chambers, and this prevents particles from getting from one side to the other, but heat can be exchanged through the wall. We'll call the volume and temperature on the left side VA and TA, and on the right side it's VB and TB. Notice that the two temperatures might be different. Let's think about some equations we know for the entropies and energies of the two sides of the container. For the energy, we know that the change in energy is equal to the change in heat plus work, and that's true for both chambers in the container. We'll just worry about infinitesimally small changes in the energy, so that means we'll use derivatives instead of deltas, and the heat will be for a reversible process. Also, remember that the wall separating the two containers doesn't move, so by definition there won't be any work performed, so we can drop work out of the equations. But now let's remember the definition of entropy suggested by Josiah Gibbs. If we rearrange the equation slightly, we can see that the heat exchange is equal to the temperature times the change in entropy. Let's go ahead and plug that into our equations for the energy of each chamber in our system. We can determine the entropy change for each chamber by solving these equations for ds, which gives us this. So that makes the overall entropy equal to dUA over TA plus dUB over TB. But wait, this result is actually really interesting for the system that we're working with. 
Here's why. For this system, we know that the entire system is isolated, which means that energy can't get in or out. That means that if the energy changes on one side of the container, an equal but opposite change must occur on the other side. In other words, dUB is just equal to the negative of dUA. Let's use that value of dUB in our equation. Now we can factor dUA out of the expression, which gives us this. So what does this prove? Actually quite a lot, and here's why. There are only three possible ways for the temperature of the two chambers to be. Either Ta is higher, Tb is higher, or both are the same. Let's consider each of those possibilities. First, suppose that the left chamber is hotter, so Ta is the higher temperature. That means that energy will flow out of that chamber and into the right-hand chamber. In other words, dUA will be a negative number. In addition, since Ta is greater than Tb, that means that the term in parentheses will also be a negative number. Since both terms on the right side of the equation are negative, that tells us that the entropy change will be a positive number. So, to sum up, when the left side of the container is hotter, the entropy of the system will increase overall. Now let's suppose the right chamber is hotter, so Tb is the higher temperature. That means that energy will flow out of that chamber and into the left-hand chamber. This time, dUA will be a positive number. In addition, since Tb is greater than Ta, the term in parentheses will also be positive. Since both terms on the right side are positive, that tells us that the entropy change will also be a positive number. So, when the right side of the container is hotter, the entropy of the system increases overall. So, we've seen that the entropy of the system will increase whenever either side of the container is hotter than the other. The only time that isn't the case is when both sides of the container have the same temperature. In that case, there is no net energy change on either side, so the entropy change is zero. In that situation, energy is exchanged equally between both chambers. In other words, the two sides are in equilibrium when the entropy is zero. In the other situations, where one chamber was hotter than the other, energy only flows in one direction, so that's an irreversible process. It's also a spontaneous process, so what this demonstrates is that a spontaneous process must always result in an increase in the entropy of an isolated system. And that fact should sound familiar. It's the second law of thermodynamics, which we've learned about before. When we first saw it back in video 20, we arrived at this result using purely mathematical arguments based on statistics. This time, we've derived the second law by thinking about natural phenomena like a container filled with gases at two different temperatures. Anyway, one major point to remember is that, as we just saw, the change in entropy is always greater than or equal to the reversible heat exchange over T. And, in fact, we saw that it's only equal if the system is at equilibrium. If we're looking at macroscopic changes in the entropy instead of infinitesimally small ones, we can change the derivative here to a delta, which gives us this. Well, that's enough new material for now. In the next video, we'll explore some more of the consequences of the second law of thermodynamics, and we'll also start to see how we can apply this to our understanding of chemical reactions. We'll find out that entropy is one of the most important factors in determining whether a reaction will occur in the forward or reverse directions. It's one of the most important concepts to grasp in physical chemistry, so I hope you'll join me for that. But until next time, have a good week!